another volume method named after a food. I'm going to call this the mashed potatoes method. If you look this up in a calculus book or a YouTube video, the calculus people are probably calling this volumes of irregular base. There's a big difference between this one and the pancake and donut methods that you've recently learned, and that is this. In this problem, you still have a region, just like before, but now the region is not going to be rotated about the x or the y axis or any other line. Instead of that, this region is going to act like a base of a geometric figure. So imagine that this is the outline of the base of a pile of mashed potatoes. This is difficult to imagine, but the mashed potatoes are kind of coming out. You can't really see that on video, but I'm doing a kind of like an outlining a pile of mashed potatoes put into here. Kind of a good way to think about it is imagine that this was the form of a cookie cutter. It would be a boring cookie cutter, but you can imagine the form of a cookie cutter there. And that a chef just takes a pile of mashed potatoes and starts just jamming them into the cookie cutter. And then as the pile of mashed potatoes grows inside the cookie cutter, the chef sculpts it so that it's all nice and pretty so that the top of the mass of potatoes looks uh, like a, a rounded surface or all sorts of different types of surfaces. I realize this is difficult to imagine. Um, let's start going on the problem and hopefully that becomes a little bit more clear. This is the base of a pile of mashed potatoes and cross sections cut perpendicular to the y-axis are squares. Here's what this means. If I imagine pile of mashed potatoes growing straight up out of the paper and I did a cut that is perpendicular to the y-axis. Imagine kind of a knife just going straight down through the mass of potatoes till it hits the bottom. Okay, and then if I were to take that slice that I just did, paper thin slice, and lift it up out of the mass of potatoes, I would be holding a square. So in other words, that slice would lead to a square that I can pull right out of the potatoes. By the way, if I did a slice right here, that's a slice, and it would lead to this very tiny paper thin square of mashed potatoes. And then as you would figure, if I did a slice down here, that slice would be a square that's even larger than this one. So what I basically have is an infinite number of paper-thin squares that I've sliced out of here. And I know they're squares only because that's what it said in the original problem. They could give you other figures other than squares. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to integrate or accumulate or add them up a bunch of side squares. Now why did I do that? Because a square has an area of side times side or side squared. So this is the area of the square. I have my beginning slice and my ending slice. They told us we're going to cut perpendicular to the y-axis, so we're going to cut like So I know I'm progressing along the y-axis, that's why that's a dy. And by the way, this distance, that's a pure x value, a purebred x value. It starts at the axis and goes over to the function. So that's an x. And since this is a square, that has to be an x. So beginning slice, ending slice. That happens because my first slice is down here at y equals 0. My last slice is up here at y equals 9. I want to say x squared because that distance is an x, but x does not 
cooperate with the dy. So I take this equation and I turn it into an x squared equation. I mean, an x equals equation. What would that be? That'd be a 9 minus y, and I would have to square root it. And I would need the plus or minus, but that's not going to matter here because I'm going to square it. So by the way, when I square the square root, it goes away. I could leave it like that, or I could turn it into that. And whatever this becomes when I plug it into my calculator will give me the volume answer. Like I've said in previous videos, I may or may not care about the final answer because they may just ask me for an integral that represents the final answer. So it's a big difference compared to the volumes of revolution because I'm not searching for circles. There's no rotation about the x-axis. But I'm going to show you why you can get them mixed up with volumes of revolution on this next example. All right, I have a new region. It's using the e to the x function. And in this case, I said it's going to start at 2 and end at 8. So we really only care about this region. Now this region is not going to be rotated about any axis. It just represents the base of a pile of mashed potatoes, a cookie cutter form in which they jam the mashed potatoes into there. Well now, the chef has sculpted the mashed potatoes to be semicircles. So coming out of this base is this beautifully rounded semicircle of mashed potatoes. This semicircle would be smaller. This semicircle would be much larger. Hard to imagine, I know. So the big picture is my first slice and my last slice beginning to end of a bunch of semicircles, so I have to do the 1 half pi r squareds. I know it's dx because I'm traveling along the x-axis. 1 half pi r squared is the area of a semicircle. Well, I say we have some danger with the r, and here's what I'm talking about. We talked about the beginning and the end. 1 half pi, nothing to see here, but look what happened with the radius. You would say, wait a second, I think the radius would be this entire distance, which is a y value. But I say my radius is 1 half y. Here's why. No pun intended. This is the radius because remember, if I were to slice that whole distance, this is not really accurate, but that's the diameter. This entire distance is the diameter of a semicircle. The semicircle goes like this. That distance is the diameter of the semicircle. So I only need half of that distance for my radius. So instead of writing y squared, I write 1 half y squared. That's really tricky. In all your volumes of revolution problems, the thinking would lead you to knowing that this entire distance was the radius. So just be very careful there. And at this stage, I'm going to take the 1 half y squared and call it a one-fourth y squared. The one-fourth that I got here times that one-half gives me the one-eighth. The y squared stays. And this has made it more simple, but I still have a y when it's a dx problem. But y is the same thing as e to the x, so I just replace it. Everything else stayed the same. And From there I can get my answer if I care about an answer, but I might just care about the integral. The reason I showed you this one is you've got to be careful thinking about your r or your radius. 
That's it for the mashed potatoes. Anybody want some gravy?